was gonna say like I'm your host, Tim, and uh, and then I feel like I'm not like an airplane pilot. Hi, oh, you're your pilot. His name's Tim, um, <laughs> which just seemed really strange. Um, anyway, so tonight we're gonna talk about how foil was adapted into epé during the late 19th century, um, and specifically 19th century foil. So. Um, if anyone out there in sort of viewing land is, does modern Olympic fencing, um, by all means, like, you know, talk about the differences. Um, I, I mean, my experience is that modern Olympic fencing is not the same, but certainly similar to um, to historic, like, 19th century uh, foil fencing. Um, and certainly the foil has been recognisable um, in, ter like, in terms of practice. The fo you know, foil has been recognisably foiled for a very long time. Um, compared to, say, Epe, which was, you know, starting in, well, I guess, kind of, you have, like, proto-Epe in the 1860s, and then you start in the 1870s and 80s, that's when you start to get, like, Epe, 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 like, modern Epe. Um, weirdly enough, modern Sabre is actually, or Sabre is actually the most recent in terms of being distinctly modern Olympic, because which really didn't seem to start until sometime around World War I. Um, but, you know, Sabre, like saber fencing in the late nineteenth century used a very different weapon, and therefore very different techniques. Um, and yeah, um, it's kind of actually the most recent in a weird way. Uh, but yeah, so in the late nineteenth century, there was a point where people started to realize that dual or um, you get experienced foil fencers who were getting into duels uh, with in some cases, people with no or minimal fencing training and then losing and um, like really struggling. Um, and they know, you know, and so there was an effort to redress that. And that's kind of where Epe comes from, where people are saying, hey, you know, the foil game that we're playing in fencing cells and, you know, on our lawns and just, you know, for lols isn't really actually that similar to what happens in a duel. And then you get, um, particularly well, in France, where a lot of the duels were happening. You start getting people going. Okay, well, what kind of fencing would you need for a duel? Um, and so you get people like Jacob, um, Lamarche. I'm, not sure. I, I'm going to apologise to any French speakers out there. I'm going to butcher your language, and I'm sorry, but I don't know. Fucking fight me. <laughs> Just come to Australia and we'll fence, and that that's the only solution really. Um, and then go to the pub afterwards because you know, when in Australia, you go to the pub. Um, yeah, so uh, basically, for um, foil was other uh, people were increasingly realizing that foil was inadequate, um, and so they started to develop epe fencing. And to do that, they took foil fencing um, because foil fencing was the movement vocabulary of the period. So, like you know, the saber fencing of the period, um, and also bayonet, and really like even like stick and stuff were discussed in terms of foil fencing terms like you would learn foil fencing and that would teach you the movement vocabulary you'd need to understand all these other weapons and so they just did the same thing with um with epe and what they but what they did was start modifying epe based on the demands of the duel and it's really really interesting the commentary about um epe um or really interesting the commentary at the time because you get a lot of people talking about how um you hear a lot of people talking about um, how your know, foil fencing has, all, like, people take advantage of the rules. I mean, Alfred Hutton in Cold Steel, much as we think of Cold Steel as a saber treatise, um, hence why, like, you know, the modern incarnation even has um, a plate from Miller's broadsword treaty on it that appears in the manual. Um, he did actually write about Epe, but he didn't. He didn't actually write a technical manual. He didn't put down any drills. He didn't put, describe any techniques or anything like that. He's entirely describes what you should do in an epe duel and where he can't describe it succinctly in terms of, fen of foil fencing. What he does is just goes, Oh, well, use this thing from dagger. So, when, when he comes to defending the, the sword arm, he says, Okay, well, you know, in terms of defending the sword arm, you know, have a read through my dagger section and like use the arm defenses from that to protect your sword arm. Um, but yeah, he. You know, like there's no sense of that. There's no sense that Epe has necessarily unique techniques of its own. Um, it's just modified foil fencing. It's this thing from foil, but um, what um, and what I find quite interesting is that Epe, um, particularly early on, was a lot more cautious. 
And they used to have um, bounce, ma FA fencing matches were done to one hit, they're elimination tournaments. So you'd only, you know, you'd only fence it, you'd fence until someone was hit and then um, the person who scored the hit would go on, you know, would go on and continue, would, you know, would win, the, would win the, the entire, like the entire, you know, sort of the entire match, not just like a single round. Um, although that was changed in the early 20th century because um, there was this huge issue where a less skilled fencer could defeat a more skilled fencer. Um, by just feed a more skilled fencer by um, usually just um, by luck or by you know, athleticism. There's actually there's a, an article I think I posted to the group today uh, from an Australian newspaper where the um, Paris correspondent is talking about dueling and one of the things he complains about is that there are these fencing maskers teaching people to basically just stab at the weapon arm until um, they hit it and then they win the duel. Um, <laughs> Which, as someone who's very, very fond of stabbing at the weapon arm, I kind of, you know, I felt a great deal of um, sympathy for, but also a little bit attacked by that, you know, someone's like, you know, that someone's like, um, you know, someone's like, oh, this is, well, actually, it was really, really interesting for me. Um, you know, it was really, really interesting for me that um, the criticism of, um, the criticism of this practice is similar to one that, I've faced in the modern HEMA community where people like people complain that I, you know, I overemphasize attacking the sword arm and it just creates cheap, easy wins, which, you know, I, I don't really see a problem with. But it's kind of just it's just kind of nice that the um, the same discourses that are happening in the modern HEMA community were happening back then. I think it's because swordsmanship is not a monolithic thing. There's no absolute right, contrary to what George Silver thinks, um, and so to kind of um, to kind of replicate the dynamic, the, the disc, you know, the dynamic of historical sword fighting, you kind of have to replicate the discourse, like people having different opinions and pros and cons and whatnot, and you know, the debates that happened. And the modern human community has done an amazing job of basically arguing about the same stuff that were argued with back in the day, um, with you know, and in some cases even using um, sources. Uh, when they use sources to back up their opinions, they're like, oh, this source says this, and then someone goes, but this source said this, therefore you're wrong. And it's like, well, no, it's just that they had the same debate back in the day. Um, cool. So now let's get started with the technical side of the lesson before I don't talk you off about, you know, fencing history for far too long. Um, and bust out our epee. So this is, for those who don't know, this is my mock-up of a historical epee. So um, in the 19th century, the first epees um, had centered guards. Um, this is probably at the smallest end of what they would have had. Um, a lot of them had, you know, bigger guards. And Hutton even comments that with, um, you know, when you're fencing with epees, the fact that the um, the guard is so much bigger um, will actually, you know, give you all, particularly your sword arm, a lot of protection. Um, also, the other thing they tended to have was straight handles. This is a, actually a modern saber handle. Like this is something I've sort of mocked together to look like a historical um, epee, but you know, it does the trick, it works, it's a good simulator. All right, so let's start off. Um, and probably the first the first big point of difference, um, something that a lot of manuals say, you know, a thing you need to do differently when you're dueling with an epee as opposed to just, uh, sort, you know, just playing foil, is you need to have a different guard. Uh, so let's start off, you know, with the foil guard. So to form the foil guard, we form basically the same medium guard that I've used for a lot of my other, a lot of the other weapons I've taught, whether it's sabre, knife, cane, whatever. Um, but that's the medium guard. And so all I do is I stand at basically the tension with my feet together, and I bring my offside, so my non-sword side foot round behind my sword side foot. Um, just come side on so you can see it. I step my feet to roughly two foot apart, maybe more, maybe less, and bend my knees till I'm in a comfortable squat. And the way I test if my knees are bent enough is if I'm comfortable, that means that you know I'm not too low, um, but the way I test is if I can step without bobbing my head up and down. Um, because I've, you know, the reason you bend the knees, one is to eliminate extraneous movement, both you know, rocking of the head, but also needing to bend the knees to step. And then with my backhand, I bend it at 90 degrees, I hold my upper arm out horizontally, um, and my hand is kind of vertical and sort of sits here, just kind of chilling, um, just kind of chilling until I need for something, um, but also nice and out of the way, so I'm not going to get whacked in the arm. 
And my front arm, the foil fencing, bends also at 90 degrees. My forearm is basically horizontal. Um, my um, and my sword, my sword tip is pointed, probably sitting at about shoulder height. Um, another cue for this, actually, when you've got a thrusting weapon, is that you want to you want your sword to be pointing um, at the bridge of your opponent's nose. That way, if you thrust, you'll um, that way if you thrust, um, you'll be going up the line of sight, which will make it a little bit harder to detect. Although this is kind of weird with foil fencing, because in foil fencing, the only target is the torso, so you don't actually stab people in the face. Um, but yeah, this is the basic guard that is used in foil fencing. Um, with epee, what the epee people say is they're like, okay, well, if you have your sword at an angle, yes, you can, you've got more varied play with this. And to be honest, when I fence epee, I do actually go to the medium guard if I'm familiar with my opponent, um, because it gives me a lot more versatility. But what they say is, because your blade can be worked upon in so many ways, you need to um, hold it horizontally, which is you bring everything down, um, and you actually even grip the sword, I'll show you that up close, you even grip the sword with the pommel sword in the palm of your hand, so you get this big straight line. And then you extend your forearm out so it's level roughly with the breast. You want your arm, you don't want it dead straight um, because that locks your arm, which makes it difficult to move. You, but you don't want it. You don't want it sitting down here because now the sword obviously is not. The sword is too low and is not. You know, is not providing a reasonable threat. Also, your forearm is very, very exposed. So you want to extend it out to. Um, Jill Jacob says about the height of the breast, um, which I assume is like roughly nipple height. Um, so yeah, this is the FA guard. And the advantages of this, and I might, I'm going to switch to a stick. Um, for those who haven't come before, I often use uh, my trusty stick to demonstrate stuff um, for no other reason than the thin epee blades and any kind of darkish metal blade doesn't show up too well on camera, whereas the stick does. But yeah, I have, you know, with my trusty stick. When my, sword, when my sword is basically horizontal like this, um, it gives me, I have a huge advantage in that in order to attack my blade, there's very, very limited actions my opponent can do that they can, or very few ways my opponent can attack my blade and then me in quick succession. So to work on my blade, they basically have to push, you know, they basically have to push very, very sideways, in which case their sword's not aiming at me. And what I can do, is obviously you use things like disengages. For those who are new to um, fencing, disengages where I just drop the tip under my opponent's blade. So just draw a little like um, half circle um, to change the side my sword is on. Um, but I can even just, because my arm is so extended, I can also just retract to an all medium guard and come back out. So if my opponent brings my sword offline, like does something funky, I can just retract to here and come back out very, very quickly um, which means that I'm usually going to be on guard in a proper guard to deal with any action my opponent makes against me, which I find quite useful. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of, they ref, there's even references to this as the FA guard or a guard specifically for FA. And I don't think I've really seen, I mean, I've seen similar sorts of things in some saber work, like, you know, French saber work where they stand like this, but it's not the same. It's not. This is very much an epee. This is one of this is probably the most or the only epee specific technique of the period. Um, like and even things where you're thrusting to targets that you're you're thrusting to targets that you can't foil. Those are still skills and things you see in saber um, and in you know in saber. Like it's you know the ideas or the motions are not unique to epee. The only thing that's really unique to epee is the guard, which is that. Um, speaking of like thrusting to you know non-foil places, so for those who don't know, uh, in both modern Olympic foil and dating well back in you know well back into the 19th century, um, in foil the only target was the torso. So basically from like my you know basically from my collarbones, um, I'm probably sitting my microphone, collarbones down to like the bottom of my waistcoat, um, was the only valid target. Um, this was originally started less, this was originally started for safety reasons. But there's a lot of people who have technical rationalizations, like, you know, going, teaching people to go to the body, teaches them to do bolt fences. Like, 
when epi when people start doing epi fencing, one of the first things they say is don't go to the body ever, or not don't go ever, but like don't go like you know only ever go if you're you're definitely sure you're in a position to attack the body. Otherwise, don't like it's just too risky. Um, but no, the reason for the reason why in foil um, is only the torso as target is one to de one to eliminate cheap shots, so people can't just you know stab their opponent in the sword arm. Um, which is a very, very easy strategy to learn, but for two, it's for safety. So um, before fencing masks, um, or when fencing mask, or when you have more primitive masks that are like a metal face mask with like proper like eye holes that are only a little smaller than the glasses, um, you don't want people regularly going stabbing into the face because sure, you know, you can put a big leather ball on the end of your foil, and it'll you know, and it will for the most part won't go through the eye slits. But there will occasionally be mistakes, and if you're constantly stabbing to the face, you know, the, you know, even if it's only like you know less than one, you know, like one percent of um, stabs to the face actually cause any kind of injury. If you get stabbed to the face a hundred times, you know, whilst playing foil, one of those is going, you know, is going to cause a problem. So no thrust to the face, and so they limited thrusting fencing to the torso, um, which made it like made it a much more convincing or much more interesting sport, made a more interesting leisure activity, but also less martially useful as martial training. So in Epe, what, they, uh, what a lot of manuals say to do is you primarily attack the weapon arm. Now I'm gonna have to switch back to my Epe for this because the guard is super important. But when I am on guard, I wanna keep my arm right behind my shelf. This is also why you don't want your arm down here um, like you don't want to just take a um, you know take a traditional foil guard and bring the tip down because your opponent can come in quite over the top of that quite easily. Whereas if I'm extended here, I'm quite protected by my shell. And to attack my arm, my opponent is going to have to try and come like is going to have to try and sneak around it. Uh, conversely, though, I still want to spar, spar to the arm. So if you are when you are practicing FA with a friend, one of the first things you should really be doing. Um, after you've kind of got the hang of the basic techniques and movements, is fence exclusively targeting the weapon arm, because that is a really fundamental skill in 19th century epi fencing. Um, and what particularly, um, and what different masters say to do is, um, Jules Jacob even suggests basically that you should come on guard at lunge distance of your opponent's sword arm. And so, you know, you only can hit the sword arm. Hutton says basically you fence with um, demi lunges, so you don't go like you do like a really short little lunge like you do in say Saber, as opposed to a big long kind of you know, nice foil lunge. Um, there's sort of various opinions, but basically the idea is you're going to be attacking your opponent's sword arm. Um, to do that, there's an element of brinkmanship. So if I'm going to attack an opponent's sword arm, I can't thrust straight because they're shell, so I have to sneak my sword around. I have to basically bring my sword around and kind of bring the tip around. The problem is, as you can see front on, the more I do that, the more I bring my tip around, the more of my forearm you can see, and therefore the more risk that if I miss, my opponent is going to count is going to counter thrust. So let's do some drills. Let's actually look at um, thrust, and then we'll look at the counter to said thrust. So. When I'm thrusting to the arm, I like to do it on demi lunge, um, mostly because when I was like practice, when I was working on um, my 19th century epee, I was with a lot of small sorters who wanted to come to a distance where they could hit the torso on a lunge, and so rather than constantly like bickering over distance, I just attack on demi lunges. Also, because I tend to use a lot of demi lunges because my footwork's not very good. <laughs> um, so yeah, but all you do to thrust. So extend, so let's pop this arm out, and I use this as the impetus to come forward. Um, and the way I find works quite effectively, which is maybe not the best lunge technique when you're um, you're doing like proper like you know good classical foil, but there are historical sources that support this. You flick out, I bring my weight forward, and I step, and see how this fire and that fires me forward. Like I'm just using this weight transition to come forward very shortly. And then most of my strength, my muscles actually going to retract in. So extend, wait forward, step, bounce back. Just bang, and straight back. So let's do that by numbers. So extend, wait forward, step, bounce back. 
extend, weight forward, step, bounce back. Extend, weight forward, step, bounce back. Extend, weight forward, step, and bounce back. Extend, weight forward, step, and bounce back. And extend, weight forward, step, I'm getting ahead of myself, and bounce back. All right. So we've done that as like a broke, as like a specific order. Now I'm going to give you one call. I'm just going to call lunge. And I want you to do the whole thing in one smooth movement, but still using that order. So don't, like don't try and bring everything together at once because that's a good way to get stabbed in the face. Uh, which actually happened to me last Saturday. I, you know, did everything one, I did one bad lunge and got nailed in the face. And well, you know, I, I was kind of proud though because, you know, one of the people I've been teaching at lunch now, I'm in the face very effectively, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, anyway, but I'm gonna call lunge. I want you to do the same kind of order as a smooth chain of movement. So lunge, 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 and lunge. All right, so I've got the basic mechanics of the attack down. Now the thing we need to consider is how do we get around the guard? So if I launch a straight lunge at my opponent, I'm gonna hit straight into the guard. Um, and so there's kind of this element of brinkmanship where my hand gets slightly, you know, slowly wider as I want, try and wind around. Um, I never wanna let my hand get wider in the positions of cart, TS, or six. Um, for reference, this is the hand position of cart. Uh, my hand is in this alignment um, and is sitting in line with my offside or my my you know my off my non-sword side of my body. Um, you know, so when I don't want to let my hand drift out further than that, get out to here because I'm definitely getting nailed in the arm. Whereas this, I'm still kind of in the same line. I can flick it back on quickly if I need to. And it's tears. My hand is in this alignment, like this. My tip is, my, um, it's in line with the sword side of my body, so it's just off the center line and just enough to sort of reach around. And then with six, my hand is basically in the same alignment as it was for cart, but it's in line with the sword side of my body, like here. And I can even, I can even just contort my wrist a little bit to try and come around, just poke around. Actually fine for getting around a guard, six is a bit, is better for doing it than car than tier sorry. Cart's just awesome in FA. Um, but yeah, doing it in six seems to just work a little bit better. I can snake around a little bit more easily. Um, whereas doing this, I think to get round, I even need to, to get round, I need to bring my sword a lot wider, which I don't quite like. Um, yeah, so let's look at that. So let's look, I'm gonna call lunge. Um, and let's, but I want you to lunge in cart, tiers, or six. Actually, let's do that by numbers. So I'll do a few cart, a few tiers, and a few six. And then I'm going to start calling them randomly just so you, you, the hand positions get into your head. So from your FA guard, into cart, lunge, and back. Cart, lunge, and back. Cart, lunge. Cart, lunge. Cart lunge, cart lunge, and cart lunge. All right, cool. And now from here, we're going to try the same thing but with tears. So come to this hand position and lunge. Tears lunge, tears lunge, tears lunge, tears lunge, and tears lunge. Cool. Loosen my shoulder up. And now we're going to try six. So from here, six and lunge. Six and lunge. Six and lunge. Six and lunge. And six and lunge. Cool. So now let's mix it up a bit. I'm going to call cart lunge six lunge or tears lunge, and I want you to do that lunge, and I'll be demonstrating as well. I'm actually switch back to my stick 
um, just so you can see this, the weapon a bit better and you can see my hand a bit better. All right. Cool. So, for my guard, TS lunge, cart lunge, TS lunge, six lunge, six lunge, cart lunge, TS lunge, TS lunge, six lunge, that was a cart lunge, six lunge, cart lunge, and six lunge. All right, cool. So that's how to attack the arm, and I basically, I let my arm and my tip drift slightly wider until I can actually hit my opponent, get around their guard. Um, and certainly, uh, one of the things I found as a way to get around um, someone's guard is you launch very, very direct attacks where you basically stab them in the shell, just keep hitting them here to the point where they get used, they kind of get used to it, um, or they just become very, very cautious. Like if you've got someone who you do that and they try to take advantage, and then you in then you use the fact that they've moved to redouble and hit them in the, hit them in the arm. Um, that can, you know, um, and then once they've kind of gotten used to you just basically peppering their shell, you start sneaking wider and see if you can hit them. Um, you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily want to do something like that just off the bat. And one of the drills I do with Epe, if we've got two people, is people move back and forth, and then one throws a wide, one throws a wide thrust at the wrist, and the other person needs to react by um, basically slipping and thrusting to stab the other, to stab the aggressor in the arm. Um, so yeah, it's a good way of learning basically that if you can, if you've got a direct line to the arm, to just take it like reactively, just like bang. Um, which yeah, is apparently what a lot of people are actually taught to do to win duels is just reactively hump, relentlessly hump the arm even if you can just reactively go for it. Um, yeah, so let's actually look at redoubling um, just as a method of attack since we're on that theme I've brought it up. Um, redoubling is where you throw two attacks without fully returning to guard, but also without saying fully extent. So, um, Basically, there are three types of continual attack that you can make um, in this period. Well, the continual attacks are broken down in three specific ways. Uh, the idea behind a continual attack is I throw like one, two, like I throw two attacks in succession. I don't throw an attack and either return to guard or do a parry before throwing my next attack. Um, so there are misses, reprises, and uh, Sorry, yeah. Remisses, reprises, um, and redoubles. Um, so a remiss is a thing that you shouldn't do, where you go, you attack, you throw one attack, you stay fully extended and throw another. Uh, the disadvantage of this is, of course, if your opponent reposts at all, even reflexively, you're going to get stabbed. Even if you hit them, you're going to get hit. Um, there are very, it's very, very hard to do a remiss successfully, and you have to not only be a very good fencer, certainly much better than I am, but you also have to have felt your opponent out quite effectively um, and know what they're going to, know that they're not going to reflexively repost, because if they repost, unless you can um, suppress their repost whilst attacking, you're going to get hit. So generally the advice is just don't remiss. Um, a reprise is where you thrust, you remain on the lunge, but you, your um, attack is designed to get control of the opponent. You attack the opponent's sword rather than them. So I might attack, be parried, and then I bind or beat my opponent's sword. So I do an attacking action against my opponent's sword, so I can then come in and attack them. This is not a bad thing to do. It's difficult, um, but it is a, it is a thing. But um, the distinction is your second attack is an attack to control the opponent's sword, not an attack directly at them. And then there's a redouble. So a redouble is where I attack, I start to come back, I don't, but I don't fully return to my guard, and I use the fact that I've only come about half, you know, I've only come about halfway back to then throw a much quicker attack. Um, the reason why redoubles are better than remisses is with a redouble, I've got a bit of safety because I'm already moving back. 
and I'm taking that time to observe. So, you know, I might be fencing opponent, might attack them, go, hey, they've parried, but they've just come back to guard. And as I'm coming, you know, and like I realize that as I'm coming to sort of here, and I go, okay, well, I'm just going to re extend and use the fact that I'm a lot closer to get, make the attack more likely. Um, this is very, very good, particularly against opponents who might try and swat your sword away. So the footwork for that is lunge, half return, lunge again. Um, or even think of it just as a, like a weight transition. So I see how to start my, re uh, my return to my lunge. I start transitioning my weight back, and then I just step my foot in. It's very, very hard to pull myself back with my weight over my foot. But I, you know, the first thing I do when I return is transition my weight. And if I notice my, my opponent's made an opening, I can just transition my weight back. So that lunge, transition, relunge, or redouble, and back to guard. So lunge, transition, redouble, back to guard. 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 And this is a really, this is a really good method if you, you I find particularly useful if you've got an opponent who overreacts. So if you know, they try and really swat your sword away, particularly if you attack, you hit them in the shell, and they're actually going, ah, you can probably recover faster than they can, at which point you can redouble them. So against a really, really flinchy, overly active opponent, um, this is a very successful tactic. So that then begs the question, okay, well, how do we defend? Like, how do you defend against tax the arm? Um, and there are differing opinions. So Gilles Jacob emphasizes parries, and he says, um, he says the best parries are the parries of cart, um, cart, six, counter cart, and counter six. Um, Hutton says, on the other hand, like, cart, six, counter cart, counter six, septine, and octave. Uh, the best par you know are the best parries for this um, like you know but he says if you're defending the arm the best thing to do is actually slip it um, so I'm gonna start let's start by looking at the parries just because I think they're more useful overall and it means you've got a small number of movements that you can do you a small number of movements you can do um, to like to defend most of you so start from this guard position arm nice and bent and I'm going to start, and let's say I'm attacked to the inside, so I'm attacking on this side. All I'm going to do is turn my hand over to cart, bring it down, and bring my tip up. So my tip is now sitting a bit above my head. Right, I'm going to switch back to the stick so you all can see a bit better. I hope you appreciate my stick. Um, oh, incidentally, if you guys do have questions, just chuck them in um, the comments, um, and I will get to them when I take a break to have a cup of tea in a minute. A little parched. From here, turn my hand over. I bring my hand in line with my offside. My tip stays relatively centered, but is lifted, relatively centered, but is lifted. I want it higher so that my opponent doesn't use this as an opportunity to skim over the top of my sword. If I parry, if I come to just a, a guard position, yes, I can probably parry, um, probably you know, effectively stop an attack, but I can't. But my opponent's trying to redouble. They can get around my sword pretty fairly easily if my blade is too horizontal. I want it reasonably vertical. Well, not vertical, but up at about 45 degrees. So, you know, that. So, from here, cut. Back to guard, cut parry. 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 And back to guard. And then the other parry that, um, quite useful, um, is always quite useful for defending both the sword hand and the body, is the parry of six. So from the hand position of six, it's this one, always the same as cart but on the other side. Um, what we do to parry is we basically just do a cart parry but on the other side. And you notice my tip is staying relatively centered. I'm not, you know, I don't want my tip all the way out here because getting it, you know, or even it works out here, because then getting it back online to return is really slow and difficult. Whereas if I'm here, I keep it on the center line, 
and still got my opponent sold off. But my tip, I, all I need to do is bring my tip down to the inner guard and then I can stab to my heart's content. Or my opponent's, or my opponent's heart's discontent because I will stab them in the heart, which will discontent them. Maybe, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's going with that. All right, so guard, so six. Back to guard, 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 six. And back to guard. So these are the two kind of primary parries that um, Jules Jacob recommends. He thinks that, you know, you can defend most things with that. Um, he also thinks, although he does also think that you should use um, what he terms counter parries to disorientate your opponent. And the idea with a counter parry is that whilst I'm moving, to, I'm going to a hand position, I also disengage, I rotate my tip um, to force my opponent onto that line. So the idea is that not only am I uh, defending, I'm also disorientating my opponent because their sword is somewhere else and that can create an opening. So he reckons particularly counter card is quite useful. So if I'm in guard and my opponent attacks um, particularly to my high outside, I disengage and come to cart rather than going six from here. I disengage, I rotate my tip down and come to cart. Disengage, come to cart. Disengage, come to cart. Disengage, come to cart. And you notice me dropping my hand as well is quite useful because it creates a bit more of an angle and also helps to um, basically disor or um, it also helps to redirect my opponent's sword, so that, um, particularly knocking it upwards, so not dragging their sword across my face because I don't like being stabbed in the face. All right. So disengage, come to cart. Disengage, come to cart. Disengage, come to cart. And counter cart. Counter cart. Counter cart. Counter cart. And counter cart. All right. Cool. So those are your two primary parries that, um, that we used. They're relatively the same as they were in foil fencing, but um, just used from a different position. Um, and counter parries were quite popular in foil fencing if you're going deep to the torso, you're giving your opponent a lot of space to you know whirl around your sword and disorient you. Um, but there is another defense to the sword arm that is quite useful. And that um, and Hutton says basically just slip your arm. Um, I find that the knife's the most, he doesn't say which of the slips he recommends for defending the arm, but it's actually pretty intuitive because if I do this, because I can't cut with an epee, I'm going to spend a long time coming back online. Um, so, what I rec so mostly what I suspect Hutton is recommending is just pulling your arm back to essentially a medium guard position. And if you're a foil fencer from the 19th century, that's going to be a very, very intuitive position for you. So all you do, pull back, pull back, pull back, slip, 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 and slip. Act right, cool. So I'm going to take a quick cup of tea, if, drink of tea if someone wants to, or if anyone wants to ask some questions, or make some comments, tell me I'm doing everything wrong, which, you know, I'd rather know, to be honest. Um, that's good. So I was trying out a new rose tea from the tea center, and it is delicious. So, tea center rose tea, I Tim recommends. I mean, that wasn't that wasn't a paid endorsement at all, but you know, if the tea center wanted me to wanted to pay me to drink tea and teach sword fighting, I wouldn't object. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, cool. So we've looked at kind of the basic attacks and the basic, and like all the, the principal attack and principal att defense of, FA, of early epee. And if you're already a foil fencer, just learning to spar at the sword arm and then, um, and then taking your epee skills of going, of going to the body and Building from that is quite effect, is um, quite useful. And if you're not a foil fencer, if you're just like you're just like oh shit, I got to learn how to defend fight a duel, um, or you know even if you are a 
if you are the sort of person who maybe does other weapons, like you know, the saber, knife, cane, bayonet, <laughs> you know, um, cool, exciting things like that. Not that epee is actually epee is a really cool, exciting weapon. Probably the thing I find weirdest about Hema is that there aren't more people who get into like small sword and like 19th century epee because it's a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, um, you know, playing to the sword arm is easy enough to learn, but effective enough in a duel that it's kind of, it's what I would recommend you do if you're only really dabbling in FA and mostly focusing on another weapon. Um, but yeah, so now let, let's look, um, let's look at the kind of how you might chain um, the kind of chain FA and foil together. So let's say, you know, I've got my foil fencing skills of going to the body and I'm like, fuck it, I want to show off, I want to show how cool a fencer I am in this FA competition, um, this 19th century single hit FA competition where I've soaked my jacket in vinegar so that um, the chalk that they used for scoring, for electric scoring, will dissolve. That was seriously a thing people did. Um, like, there's this idea in um, particularly classical fencing circles that before that once upon a time fences were more honourable and more pure. Um, I mean, you see it a bit in HEMA circles as well, actually. But no, um, there's as far back as there is foil fencing, there is complaints about people using the rules of foil fencing to win when they're otherwise not good fencers. You know, taking advantage of right of way rules, turning the body or like you know putting like shoulders and upper arms and stuff in the way of um, you know, in the way of the torso so that um, they get hit on a non-scoring target. Stuff like that happens, and one of the things that they used to do is try and screw up the scoring system by soaking their jackets in vinegar, um, because vinegar would, diso would dissolve the chalk that was used to, um, dissolve to the chalk that was used to um, see if someone had been hit. Um, so yeah, it's sort of, I don't know, people are people basically. <laughs> I, I'm not, I don't appreciate, you know, being told that pe historical people are any more pure than we, or any more or less pure than we are now. E everyone has been like, you know, a complete deviant forever. Um, so yeah, so that's my kind of historical rant for today. All right, so let's say I've done my half lunge to attack, um, to attack someone's sword arm, and they parry and riposte at my arm. At my arm or even at me, trying to take advantage. I train, you know, I transition back um, or I re return. I parry on the way back. And I come to guard. I bring my tip down to point at where I'm going to hit, and I ride their sword all the way in. And I find the the best combination for this is attack to you thrust to the outside, so that your opponent then can't um, thrusts to your outside. You parry in tears. So from this hand position from before. It's also a parry, parry in tears, and then come back because I find thrusting in tears has the greatest level of weapon control, um, as opposed to you know thrusting in six, which is quicker and has nicer angles, but doesn't have near as good weapon control. Um, and I think probably why you don't see tears as much in more recent forms of fencing is because weapon control becomes less important with um, rule with um, under the rules. Um, where you know attacking easy targets in absence of epe or attacking deep targets with right of way, protecting yourself with right of way and foil, you know, becomes more important. But if you're looking for weapon control, you want to bring your hand to this position, so parry tears. All you do is bring your hand to the same position with tears thrust, except the tip is higher. And so when I attack, attack to the outside, pop in cart, I return to my tears parry. And then I tear thrust back at my opponent um, to deliver a deep target thrust. So that's kind of how you would chain the two together. And if you can pull it, when you can pull this off, it's pretty cool. So cut thrust to the outside, repot, uh, return to tears, tears thrust to the body, and back to guard. Cut thrust, tears parry, tears thrust, back to guard. And I also instinctively go back to a medium guard because I use that for everything except <laughs> epee. Right, cool. So, cart thrust, 
T.S. Parry, T.S. Thrust. Back to guard. Cut thrust, cut thrust, sorry. T.S. Parry, T.S. Thrust, and back to guard. When you do the T.S. Thrust, make sure that you bring your tip down first. Don't try and bring your tip on line in flight because you'll end up you'll end up slapping or cutting and Epace can't cut very well. So yeah, you need to bring your tip on line. Um, I think it was, there's some footage of me doing it my, early in my EPA interpretation where I'm still, I haven't quite worked that out yet. I'm trying to come online. And it looks kind of like I'm trying to do, a set, do say, defensive with an EPA. So I get like the parries and the judgment, the distance is all right. But I just keep slapping my opponent, <laughs> which, you know, like probably not the best thing to do, but eh, not the worst. All right, let's get a few rep, more reps in. So cut thrust, retract to a tears parry and tears thrust. Back to guard. So, cut thrust, retract to a tears parry, tears thrust, and back to guard. All right, cool. And now, if you really want to practice this and increase the likelihood of your shot landing, rather than um, rather than returning all the way, you want thrust. Then you just transition back, and then come straight um, and come straight back in once you've got the parry and got the control. So what I do is I cut thrust, transition to a TS parry, and then redouble to the body with a TS thrust, then back to guard. So cut thrust, transition and TS parry, then TS thrust, redoubling to the body. Cut thrust, transition TS parry, redouble to the body, then back to guard. Cut thrust, transition tears parry, tears to the body, and back to guard. And once more for luck. Cut thrust, transition tears parry, tears to the body, and back to guard. Cool. So that's how you might you you know you might start integrating skill, other skill, or your foil skills into your FA game, because as much as foil is suboptimal for dueling, it's not useless. And I think this is a very important point we talk about practical martial arts is just because something is not perfectly well suited for a purpose doesn't mean it doesn't have applications for that purpose. Um, there was a wonderful video by um, Ramsey Dewey where he talks about the difference between um, or he talks about the difference between traditional martial arts and combat sports and he says it's like both are like learning a language. The difference is um, Learning a traditional martial art is like learning um, a dead language like Latin or Old Norse. Like it's useful, and you learn you learn cool stuff that will give you insight into language, how languages work. But you can't use it to have a conversation. Learning a combat sport is like learning a living language that you can use to have a conversation, and that you can you know you can use to engage with new ideas and engage with people, um, with people, and that's kind of the thing with um, like the difference between foil and epee. Epe is useful for having a duel, but foil will still teach you a whole bunch of really useful things for that. Just not, it's just not enough. To, it's just not enough on its own necessarily. Um, yeah, so that was you know, point to, important to remember. Anyway, before we get too off topic, let's now look at the next kind of integral skill, stop thrusts. So we've talked a lot about going to the arm. We've talked about going to the body when you have control of your opponent's blade, and you can go to the opponent's body when you have a real, like when you have a really big opening. But you shouldn't do it as an opening because you will get stop thrust, especially if you have a very aggressive opponent. Sometimes you know, sometimes when people panic, they will fight incredibly aggressive. It will just go berserk, um, like the whole thing of you know, fearing getting stabbed or cut. Yep. That does make you more cautious and want to stab the arm, or but it also might make you even more aggressive and just freak out. Like you know, there's not a standard fear response. I think this is an important thing to remember. Um, cool. This is just it's a comment from Kira, which I just think is very very cool. Um, apparently they used epee blades on Seder hilts in the classic Seder Duel and Mask of Zoro film. 
1940 between Perrin Cower and Bessel Rathbone. It's just, yeah, that is some cool trivia. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's actually look at stop, but let's look at stop thrusts. So there are two stop thrust, two kind of places you're going to stop thrust to. One is to your opponent's face to disable them quickly. The other is to your opponent's body when they've tried to come, or to your opponent's body or arm when they've come deep. The, motion, the basic footwork and the basic motion for both is similar. My opponent leap gives me an opening. I extend and forward weight. So you see how I'm moving my weight over my front leg. So I'm actually getting, I'm not just extending, I'm getting a little bit more reach so I can jump forward really quickly. But at the same time, I'm lifting my back foot up and kicking it out. The reason I'm doing that is because I actually want to move further away. I want to get back. I want to get some space after I've done the stop thrust in case it doesn't fully stop my opponent or just, you know, in case I miss, in case something goes wrong, it gives me a bit of space to escape. I'm just going to come my center back into my buffer box. So again, for my stop thrust, extend the forward weight, and I get the hell out. And you see I am physically moving back. Extend the forward weight, and I get the hell out. Extend forward weight, get the hell out. Extend forward weight, get the hell out. Extend forward weight and get the hell out. Extend forward weight and get the hell out. Extend forward weight and get the hell out. And extend forward weight and get the hell out. And I can do this kind of thing to my opponent's face. I can do it to their sword arm if they give me an opportunity. Um, and I also find you get people who will, like they'll move to, you know, particularly a cart guard where it looks like their forearm is vulnerable, and they'll quickly parry six and come in when you try and have a crack at it, like they'll actually bait your response. But if you're backing off, you'll feel like you're, you're stabbing and backing off, it means you've got enough space to see that come in and react. The other thing you can do with a stop thrust is you can do what, you can go, you can basically do a slip and thrust over directly into the arm. So from here, all I do is I actually, I find the best kind of slip is just jump my feet together like this and stab to the arm. So you're seeing I'm stabbing down, so I'm coming up over the top of a poorly, um, you know, a poorly intentioned thrust. And this is very, very useful when you've set distance to my, your opponent's sword arm, so you're, you know, a lunge is most likely going to go to your arm, and then your opponent tries to do a big long lunge or a big committed movement to try and um, to try and reach you, and then they miss. And I've done this to work a number of times when I was doing the pain, it's really sweet. So I do bounce up and thrust the arm. Bounce up and thrust the arm. Bounce up and thrust the arm. And when I move up, I'm basically jumping, like I'm springing up. The reason I like this kind of slip rather than doing this for FA purposes is it's a lot faster. And honestly, after doing this, I'm not, I'm probably not going, I'm not necessarily going to try to come back very quickly. Um, you know, my opponent's going to be lying spent, probably not that far from me. Um, and so, yeah, like I can take advantage of the fact that they're going to have they're going to have a very sluggish return from very long lunge. So, like if you over lunge, I do that. It's a lot of effort to come back. Um, whereas if I do a nice short lunge, you can see how I can get the hell out of dodge really quickly. So, slip and stab. Slip and stab. Slip and stab. And slip and stab. All right. So those are kind of the main differences, how you would adapt. Um, there are other things mentioned, so beats are quite useful. Um, you know, um, there are other parries are used. I found when I was doing FA, I ended up doing a lot of transports. So I'd parry and then disengage to another location before returning. Um, I found that was quite good for driving my opponent, for like moving my opponents wide. But at the same time, I don't know if that's specifically their pay thing so much as a, I was doing that with Sabre as well. I'd probably have done it with Knife if I could have gotten away with it. So just, I think that was more kind of something I, were, I was just doing in general with Fancy at the time. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the main stuff I wanted to cover tonight as kind of a, mostly as a, you know, well, what started out as a, here's how you adapt stuff. 
here's what you do if you had to fight a duel tomorrow. In fact, that most of what I taught tonight would be my quick crash course of, okay, you're going to have to fight a duel. Here's what you do. Um, cool. So we're getting close to finishing time. Does anyone have any questions or comments, or do you just want me to talk a bit? Um, so one of the things that um, I actually got a, a lot out of in preparing for this, even though, like, I'll be honest, like, I was very pressed for time this week, so I only got to do a little bit of prep, um, and I did kind of make a commitment to myself like a week ago that I would put more, I would put aside more time to prepare these lessons, and unfortunately, I didn't follow through on that. But um, one thing that I did actually really enjoy was looking through the history of this and reading the history of the FA um, and seeing a lot of historical documents. Um, and even commentary going back a really, really long way, like um, there's a lot of comments about how foil fencing is not preparing people for the duel. Um, and it's really, really interesting that uh, you start to see people talking about um, foil fencing in terms of simulation and preparation um, in an almost very modern way. In fact, um, one thing I found really interesting is that the earliest um, FA fencing tournaments were all just single, like they were designed to simulate a duel where, you know, whoever got the first hit, uh, the first hit in won. So, you know, you'd only ever thought, you know, you know, every match was only one round of fencing or it was done until someone scored a point and then at which point they'd won, they'd won the entire match. Um, you know, um, so yeah, sort of, I found that really interesting because um, in modern, like in HEMA, there's a lot of discussion having tournaments where you know, you only have, you fight to one hit against someone, and then, um, then depending on how the tournament as a whole is scored, you might like it can you know it you know you might go on to fight other people who might not, um, because some of these tournaments propose or proposed tournaments are like elimination tournaments, um, where you get like you go in you fight one round you know, fight fencing to one hit. And then if you're the one who gets hit, if you lose, you're out of it. Like that's it. That's you're not in the tournament anymore. Um, but I find it's interesting that objections to this are kind of similar as well. In that, you know, you can have, um, you know, you can have um, fencing matches where, oh, like if you're bound to one hit, and someone who's not a particularly good fencer can just get a lucky hit in against a very experienced fencer. Um, and that, you know, which means that the person who wins is not necessarily the most skilled fencer. It's just, you know, it, it's a lot more random. Um, and the other, I mean, the other objections, and these were objections both modern and historical, were one, it's not particularly exciting for spectators. Like, it means that there's a lot of prep and set up time for a very small amount of action, which people don't tend to enjoy wanting to watch. People want to watch a lot of action. Um, but the other thing as well is it's not really that much fun for the competitors because here's the thing in particularly in a knockout tournament half the people in the tournament are only going to fight one are only going to fight one round of fencing so you know imagine you've come to you know you've come to this fencing tournament you're really excited you're really fired up you get pit you get a you know you're unlucky you know you know you're unlucky and you get pit against a really skilled opponent in the first round you lose, and that's after that. You're, you know, you just have the spectator. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's sort of, it's not very much fun. Whereas having tournaments where you have multiple bouts against the same, per multiple rounds against the same person, where you know you're in the tournament for the duration, is a lot more fun. For, is a lot more fun, and as fencing became le a leisure activity, that's kind of how it rolled. Um, so yeah, anyway. We're just fit, we're going to finish up for the night now, I think. Um, and so, yeah, thank you again for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we will be back next week. I'm brainstorming topics. I will make set up the next event tomorrow morning, most likely. Uh, but we'll probably be doing some more EPE uh, related things. Um, at this point, it looks like it. Um, um, at this point, it looks like we'll probably not be back to physical classes for a few weeks yet. Just, um, I'm still working out stuff with the venue and there's still like, as much as it feels like COVID is over, like I was in the city the other day and I was the only person wearing a mask. Um, yeah. Um, 
you know, um, it's still like a lot of COVID requirements that are a bit, you know, make things a bit interesting. So yeah, we'll, we'll see how we go. Um, and Opmix had a suggestion. Um, I said, um, I said, you could have a round, you could have a round robin. Yeah, that's true. You could have a, like a round robin style tournament um, bounding to a hit. Um, that could be quite, that could be quite cool as well. Um, I find those sorts of things are more fun, are more fun as um, or training exercises, but they're good. Um, yeah. Conversely, where Kirok has pointed out with modern fencing, Kirok has quite a bit of experience with modern fencing. If it's a lower speed against a higher speed in the first round, <laughs> yeah, that seems a bit unfair. <laughs> it's a bit, bit sad for the, you know. Um, in fact, the the one tournament I was in. Um, I fought five rounds. I won three and lost two. And the two, the two I lost, I lost to the people who came second and third in the tournament. It's just, and part of me is like, oh, I feel like I would, I feel like I would have gotten a lot better in kind of the preliminary five rounds, and I probably would have made it into the finals if I had fought, not fought, uh, if I not fought, you know, other finalists in that. But you know, that's just luck. Like the lanes were literally drawn out of a hat. Like literally, there was a physical hat. Um, Retriever, I believe, being very Australian. All right, cool. So, anyway, um, so as always, um, I hope you enjoyed tonight. Um, you know, certainly, if you want to support the club and kind of like help us continue, you know, continue doing what we do, um, you know, feel free to make a donation um, to our PayPal. I'll just put links in the comments for that. Um, and also, if you know, if you want to continue chatting about swords, which I certainly most certainly do, I'm going to be setting up. I'm going to um, be jumping on Zoom fairly soon. I'm just going to start launching it now, and kind of keep talking in the hopes that people, um, you know, people get onto the Zoom by the, um, you know, by the time I finish. But yeah, so I'll, um, we are going to jump on Zoom for a little bit, um, you know, to drink some beer or tea together and have a bit of a chat and kind of. Simulate the proud HEMA tradition of going to the pub after training. Um, so yeah, hopefully I'll see you all there. Um, and yeah, um, I will see you next week for the next next week for whatever I decide next week is going to be on. Jaloo.